Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Liverpool and the NAPF Annual Conference and Exhibition. And what a conference we've got lined up for you in the next few days. It's all about politics, people, pensions, and just a little bit of rock and roll. So it's probably no surprise that we've got another massive conference. We've also got our biggest exhibition ever with over 80 stands. So go and have a look. There's plenty to see. And it's a great place to just simply network and catch up with old friends. Now, I'd really like to thank you for coming. And thank you for making sure the NEPF annual conference remains the biggest and the best pensions conference in the calendar. But most importantly, just have a great time. Now, I'd like to talk to you today about three things. Firstly, the recent changes, new opportunities, and future challenges we face at this pivotal time for pensions. Secondly, how the NEPF is facing into this new era of retirement savings, what we're doing to represent your needs, both now and in the future. And finally, the difference we make as an industry through the investment of people's savings, but also how we could do more. Now, looking back, it's been an amazing 12 months since our last conference. In fact, it's been a revolutionary year for pensions. Revolutionary because we've seen around two and a half million more people saving for their retirement. And revolutionary because of the unexpected freedom and choice proposals in this year's budget and the positive difference they will make if we can make the expectations of those saving for retirement. Together, these are really fundamental changes and they give us the opportunity and responsibility to create a society of savers. Today, there are over four million people saving for their retirement who weren't saving just two years ago. That's a phenomenal turnaround in such a short space of time. And last year, we celebrated opt-out levels of just 10%. Could it last? Was it just a blip? Or was it just because it applied to the largest employees, in fact, the top 2%. Well, it has lasted. Auto-enrollment is sticking. Saving for retirement is becoming a habit. In fact, around one and a half billion pounds has already been saved since auto-enrollment was first introduced. And it's making a difference to real people's lives. I mean, let's just think of someone turning 25 today and earning 25,000 pounds. If they started saving right now, they'd have retirement savings worth around 118,000 pounds when they reach their state pension age of 68. And add to that a state pension of 7,500 pounds, and people can really start to look forward to retirement rather than fear it. Now, it won't buy a Lamborghini, but it will keep them from pensions poverty, which affects around 2 million of today's pensioners. And it's income they wouldn't have had without the NAPF and you pushing for that change, shaping that change, making that change work for real people. So we've come a long way. But let's not kid ourselves, because we've a long way still to go and a lot, lot more to do. Now, looking ahead, there are 7 million more people still to be auto-enrolled. And this time next year, auto-enrollment kicks in for 727,000 of the smallest employers. It's therefore important that political parties don't reverse their commitment to extend auto-enrollment to every employer in the land so that those working for the smallest employers also benefit from this fantastic opportunity. Now, we've been doing some research with small employers, and the good news is that they all knew they had to do this thing called auto-enrollment. And even better, with businesses to run, they all knew their staging dates. But there were one or two who weren't embracing pensions with open arms. 
One told us that if they chose a rubbish provider and clearly not an NAPF member, then their employees would be more likely to opt out. Fewer savers, lower contributions. Good news for that employer, but not for the well-being of their employees. Another told us that even look at the penalties for not complying and would be prepared to pay that penalty if it was less than the cost of the actual contributions. So as I said before, we're still a long way to go. And we have a responsibility as schemes that care about pensions to share both our knowledge and expertise with those smaller employers. But it is revolutionary turning a nation of pension deniers into a nation of pension devotees. And there's much, much more to come. Talking of which, freedom and choice. Now, didn't Danny Alexander say at our investment conference that it would be a quiet budget for pensions this year? Well, we certainly got a surprise on the 19th of March. And down at my water ski club, the Ever 55s were certainly smiling more about their retirement savings and the choice they now have. And of course, we all saw the headlines. People's pension power, they said. Pensions Freedom Day. And all by next April. Now, there's no denying the proposition is exciting and compelling for savers. What you, what you save, you get, and you choose how you use it. But for those of us at the sharp end who have to deliver this, April's not far away. The clock behind me is counting down the days, hours, and minutes until this has to go live. And the problem is, well, we just don't know enough about the detail. And this lack of detail, this lack of clarity, is severely limiting our opportunity to get things right for members. And it's increasing the risk of failure. I mean, just think of the scale. There are 4.2 million savers over the age of 55 who from next April will have the right to choose how they take their retirement savings. They'll have the right to choose whether to take cash, buy an income, or draw down their savings in the way that's best for them. That's 4.2 million people who will look to us to provide the right creative products for each of the options they have. 4.2 million people who will expect those products to work. Why shouldn't they? 4.2 million people who will be looking to us to help them make the right choice, as simple as possible. Now, the government has quite rightly set high expectations on the industry to respond positively, innovatively, and effectively. But the government is closing down the time we have to respond to make this a real success. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really make it count. So I say to government, help us to give freedom and choice, not fear and confusion. Give us the clarity we need to make this pensions revolution a true success. So change is all around us. It means we can't stand still as we provide workplace pensions. It means the old ways won't be and can't be the new ways. But that equally applies to us, thinking about the NAPF, your association, and how we need to respond to be relevant both today and tomorrow to meet your changing needs. In a dynamic pensions environment, we have to consider all the strategic options that can strengthen our association. And that's why last week, we said that we were in discussions about a possible merger with the Pensions Management Institute. The complementary services, strengths, and capabilities of both our organizations offer great opportunities to do more for our members and be a stronger voice for retirement savings in the UK. This is an exciting opportunity where together we can make a real difference. Now, it's one way we can do more for you, 
but it's not the limit of our ambition. As the new pensions horizon emerges, your NAPF is also redefining its focus in three key areas. Firstly, we'll speak for all of the workplace pensions community in terms of the number and the range of schemes, and in particularly thinking here of all those small employers about to enter auto-enrolment. And we want to have a clear and robust voice on behalf of those members, making sure we get our views across where it really counts, making sure we continue to make a difference. Secondly, we'll look beyond pensions and also speak about lifetime savings. That's because pensions continue to be the main way people will save and provide for old age, but not the only way. And of course, there's quite a philosophical question about what the word pension actually means, particularly after this year's budget. And we need to think about some of the new products that are likely to emerge and what they mean for schemes, trustees, and savers. And we need to think about the interface between these new products and the thing we call pensions. Where, for example, does long-term care fit into it? And if these are the questions that savers and schemes will be wrestling with, then so should we. And finally, we need to recognize that in a world of DC and increased freedom, there's a role for the NAPF in supporting savers, either through our members or more directly. So that's your NAPF, speaking up for all workplace pensions, looking beyond pensions, supporting lifetime savers. That's your association looking to the future, building on its past and supporting and speaking on behalf of members both today and tomorrow. And actually, this is all consistent with what you told us we should be doing to help you and to improve retirement savings in the UK. Earlier this year, we surveyed members about what they think about the NAPF. And I'm pleased to say that overall, you thought we were meeting your needs. However, there were three key areas where you said you either wanted more or we could do better. You told us you wanted more help and support for small schemes. You told us you wanted more help in benchmarking schemes and services. And you told us you wanted more help to educate and inform scheme members. You need it, we'll do it. Over the next few years, you can look forward to new ideas and services coming from the NAPF. We've got a really exciting future ahead, and I really look forward to working with you so we build this new future together. But we shouldn't forget the role and responsibility we have in our other capacity as investors in the economy, both at home and abroad. Now, we invest around two trillion pounds globally, including 385 billion in DC schemes that members continue to contribute towards each year. Now, that money can and does make a difference to our real underlying economy. It contributes to our nation building. And your NEPF has been supporting that in a very practical way through the development of the pensions infrastructure platform to allow pension funds to access infrastructure at fee levels that make sense. And through its investment manager, it's invested nearly a third of a billion pounds in infrastructure projects, including here on Merseyside. And you can hear more about that tomorrow morning from the PIP's new CEO, Mike Weston. And it's not just here, but also abroad, where our pension fund investment supports nation building. So that's where we play a socially useful role, beyond paying pensions to millions of people every year. And it's one we shouldn't forget and neither should governments. But just think about how much more we could do. Think about how much more pension funds could contribute to growth, jobs, and prosperity if it wasn't for the shortage in the gilt market that creates excessive demand, increasing liabilities as yields fall, requiring even more money to be pumped into the feeding frenzy of the bond market. And think of how much more funds could contribute to real growth if we weren't constrained by the charges cap 
and instead focus more on creating value. It limits the true potential of our industry. We should be creating a virtuous circle where millions of savers are contributing to prosperity, both at home and abroad. Investing in the infrastructure they use to get to work. Investing in assets and markets abroad that will bring prosperity to others, that will contribute to underlying economies, and that will create jobs and reduce poverty. So as we debate the issues of the day at this conference, let's think about how we can support pension funds, support savers, and support economies, both at home and abroad. There's a lot to play for, even more for us to do, and millions depending on us. So let's get on with it. Thank you.